I've been interested in, in plants, native plants in particular, from a very young age. I was a bit different as a kid. Uh, I, from when I was about eight years old, instead of doing what a lot of the other kids used to do, I used to do landscaping around the house and going around to the nurseries and buying any eucalypt with a different name on it and bringing it home and planting it on my parents' property. I don't know why I was like that. I just, <laughs> I just, I just um, started to become interested in native plants and it developed and became more specialised into the eucalypts. Um, and I guess I became so interested in eucalypts because of the sheer diversity in that group of plants. And, and this slide really shows that just in the flowers themselves, but there's also so much diversity in every other feature of the eucalypts, where they grow, the type of environments they grow in, how they interact with the environment. And I'll go through some of that stuff as I touch on Currency Creek Arboretum at the same time. If we just look at the form of the plants, the eucalypts vary from, well, the tallest hardwood trees or flowering plants in the world, up to 100 metres tall, and great big trees like this river red gum here up in the Flinders Ranges of South Australia, to quite small shrub or even prostrate ground cover type uh, woody plants, like this vernic eucalyptus vernicosa that grows above the snow line in Tasmania. So there's a lot of diversity. Over half of all the eucalypt species are actually the mallee species, the multi-stem ones that probably don't grow much bigger than maybe six or eight metres tall. So generally when people hear of a gum tree, they think of dirty great big red gums like the one on the right there. Uh, but one of the things I'm trying to do is, is get people more knowledgeable about a lot of the smaller growing species because the vast majority of all the species of eucalypts are the multi-stemmed shrubby species. I found the last talk really interesting <laughs> because I used the word icon a fair bit in, in these few slides. Um, I thought, oh, how am I going to talk about this now? Well, I think Australians are uniquely are, are a unique icon to Australia because really there's no other continent in the world where there's one group of plants that really dominates pretty well every landscape, whether it be a natural landscape, an urbanised landscape or an agricultural landscape. So there's, depending who you ask, over 900 terminal taxa or species and subspecies of eucalypts. All but maybe five or six of them grow in Australia. And then there's about another dozen or so species that also extend up to the islands to the north, so Indonesia, New Guinea. So it really is a group of plants that is pretty well uniquely Australian, except for that handful of species. Um, it, it, it is interesting, though, that that rainbow gum is actually the most widely distributed species in the wild of all the eucalypts, and it doesn't grow in Australia at all. Um, so it's one of those exceptions to the rule. They are iconically Australian, but they're valued and planted worldwide, and there's actually more eucalypts planted outside of Australia than have ever been planted in Australia. From an economic point of view, they're probably the most valuable group of plants to ever come out of Australia. Uh, for all sorts of uses, of course, from, from timber, fuel, wood, paper pulp, to, to honey production, shelter, erosion control, a whole range of things. And most countries you go to around the world, you'll actually see eucalypts. And it actually takes you back to Australia when you see these eucalypts. Uh, they grow well in, in fairly cold areas like the United Kingdom. And the picture there on the, the left is actually the tallest tree in Europe, believe it or not. It's a Eucalyptus diversicolor, a carry, that I measured at 72 metres tall in Portugal. So the tallest tree in Europe is a eucalypt. They're a bit like weeds overseas. Like, um, so we get all the European and North American weeds, they come here and we complain about the willows and the, the pines. But we've given the rest of the world eucalypts and they can become a bit weedy like that in other places. The tallest tree in Africa is also a eucalypt. The tallest tree in North America, excluding the conifers, is also a eucalypt. So they're widely planted around the world and they're really successful around the world. A quick slide about, um, I guess, eucalypt classification. When I talk about eucalypts, I'm talking about three genera of plants. I'm, I'm not just talking about eucalyptus. I'm also talking about Carimbia, which has about 100 species, and Angophora, which has about 12 species. You need to note that um, National Eucalypt Day actually covers all three genera. It's not just eucalyptus. Collectively, this group, uh, these three genera are all, all known as eucalypts. Currency Creek Arboretum. It's called Currency Creek Arboretum because of the nearby landmark of Currency Creek in South Australia. To go back to my earlier story, when I was going around to all the nurseries buying any eucalypt with a different name on it and planting it on my parents' property, this was happening through my teens. 
And my parents could see if they wanted to sell their, their little 10-acre block and retire at some stage, I couldn't keep planting my trees on there. So when I was about 16 years old, my parents helped, helped me buy this property. They did buy this property. Um, 32 hectares or 80 acres, about an hour's drive south of Adelaide. I'm lucky enough to have my parents here tonight and, and they've probably been the biggest influence on me in terms of not just Currency Creek Arboretum, but everything I do with Eucalypts. Um, so I, I can't thank them more than anybody else. But then buying this property allowed them to eventually sell up and retire. So it was a good thing for them as well, and I had somewhere to plant my trees. As I went through uni, um, sort of not long after this property was bought, I decided I wanted to set this up in a different way to how Arboreta was set up in the past, where you know things were just planted, weren't, even, weren't always recorded where they came from. I wanted to be a bit more systematic about it. Uh, so rather than just plant things anywhere, I've planted everything in rows and recorded exactly where I've planted everything. So this is what it looked like uh, early on. The first plantings went in um, in 1993, which coincidentally was the year that, that Dale died. So that's what it looks like on the left there before any plantings went in and a little bit after that. These are some more recent photos there. So each year worth of trees is planted in, in a block in rows with equal spacing. So I can just record where everything is on the database. And this is what some of the older plantings look like now. These trees are about 20 years old. So the oldest trees there are 20 or 21 years old. That's an aerial photograph taken a few years ago now. So each one of those four boundaries is about half a kilometre long to give you an idea of the, the, the size of the property. And each one of the blocks is a different year's worth of planting. So there's been plants put in every year except for two or three years since uh, 1993. And that's just overlaid with the, the block plantings to show the years there. You can see it's almost full of trees except for a few sections where there's some remnant vegetation. The other thing that I wanted to do differently, apart from have really good records of everything, um, or rather to get really good records of everything, I wanted to collect the seed of everything grown at the Arboretum in the wild, from wild populations, with voucher specimens and detailed location information and other information on on where the tree's growing in the wild. And that's really one of the, the really good things about eucalypt research is it takes you to all these interesting places. And if I map where all the collecting locations I've done throughout Australia, where I've collected eucalypt, tree, eucalypt seed off trees and taken them back to Currency Creek Arboretum, this is what it looks like. And this actually matches that, that earlier map we saw in the last talk in terms of the eucalypt distribution. There's a lot of diversity in the southwest of the state, there's a lot of diversity up the southeast coast of Australia, and there's a few patches in between where there's not too many eucalypts like the Nullarbor Plain and some of the desert regions. It also shows that I also collect along roadsides quite a bit, <laughs> uh, particularly in the more remote areas where you, know, you don't necessarily need to get off the road to see, to see some of the species in the wild. So at each site I'll collect seed from a single a representative mother tree, and I'll also collect a voucher specimen which will look like this. Basically, it, it's a, a specimen that's pressed and dried. It'll have leaves on it, the gum nuts, the, the flower buds, and any other, and also a label that says where it came from, information about the site. So it's like a voucher specimen. And then I'll grow seedlings of them all. But as well as growing seedlings to plant out at the Arboretum, I'll also grow extra seedlings, pull them out of the pots, press them, dry them, and have a seedling specimen for, uh, for each collection I've made as well. And that's because eucalypts are dimorphic, which means they have um, two leaf phases, a juvenile leaf phase and an adult leaf phase. And the juvenile leaf phase is, is often um, really useful in discriminating different species. The other thing is having herbarium specimens like this, which are then deposited in, in the various state herbaria around Australia, means that if anybody's doing research on that group of species, if the name changes on the specimen, then I find out about it and the name can change on the tree in the Arboretum. So I try to keep up to date with, with the names of the plants in that respect. So that's a, the whole heap of seedlings there about to go in the ground. The general pattern is I'll plant four trees that are grown from seed from a single mother tree in the wild, rather than just one. Obviously the more trees you plant, the better. 
uh, because it gives a better representation of the variation within that particular mother tree. So some of the things we're doing at Currency Creek Arboretum, and just to go back to that last slide, variation within the species, uh, there can be several reasons for that. But where there's four trees growing like this from a single mother tree in the wild, part of the reason is genetic. If you take seed from a single tree, you know that that tree is the mother tree, but the pollen parent could be four different trees for where you've got four trees like this. It could be the same tree, though, so you, you just don't know. So there's some generic, genetic variability from tree to tree whenever you grow them from seed. Even within a species, there can be a lot of variability. Tasmanian blue gum, uh, one of the best-known eucalypts, is a really good example of that. In the wild where it grows, it can vary from uh, this tree on the, on the left here, which is one of the, the biggest trees in Australia. They've estimated the wood volume of that tree is 368 cubic metres. That's a lot of timber. The one on the right there, also growing in the wild in Tasmania, right on the coast, it's only a, a few metres tall. Part of the reason for that variation is genetic, part of it might be environmental as well, because obviously one's right on the coast, so conditions are different to the one on the left, which happens to be in the middle of uh, rainforest. Still in Eucalyptus globulus, but if we come into cultivation, you get a whole heap more variation in, in just what the form of the whole plant looks like. This one on the left, this is a, a variety or a cultivar of the Tasmanian blue gum that came out of California, of all places, called the bushy blue gum. They were marketing it in the nurseries. It's a dwarf form of Tasmanian blue gum. But you can see from that pic there, that's one of the reasons why eucalypts have got a bad name over the last few decades, because people were buying the bushy blue gum, planting it in their garden, and this is at Mount Gambier, so um, in one of the parks in Mount Gambier. And if they don't grow into big trees like that, or even where they do, often they end up like the one on the right there. Uh, that, that's one in the Adelaide Hills where it's been taken out of its natural environment, grown in cultivation. The rainfall in the Adelaide Hills isn't just, just isn't enough to sustain a mature tree and they can deteriorate in health and you can get failures like that. So that's what we want to move away from, planting Tasmanian blue gums in little gardens. One of the things with Currency Creek Arboretum, um, I often take groups of people through there and probably the one thing they get out of it more than anything else, is just seeing the sheer diversity in, in form um, in all the different aspects from, from the habit of the plant to the, the floral form, form like this. And I've just thrown these couple of slides in to show how unusual the flower buds can be. Uh, both these two species have those warts on the flower buds. And as far as I'm aware, nobody knows the, the reason why they have the warts there. Nobody knows the the evolutionary advantage in having warts on the flower buds. It makes it useful for a botanist because you can identify the species easily. But why do eucalypts have all these, you know, weird features um, in some species but not others? So there's all, all those sort of questions that I enjoy, I enjoy showing people this sort of diversity. There's lots of eucalypts that don't look like eucalypts, like this species here looks like the, the broom bush, Melaleuca uncinata, but it is a true eucalypt. It has all the features of the eucalypts. That's Eucalyptus angustissima, which means very narrow. That plant's actually growing at Currency Creek Arboretum. Very high content of oil in the leaves. They actually grow this species for eucalyptus oil in, in WA. This species here, another one that doesn't look like a eucalypt. This is probably Australia's rarest species. It's called Eucalyptus recurva. It grows near, um, I guess, between Canberra and the coast in New South Wales. And it's only known from three individual mallee clumps. It doesn't produce fertile seed. So it's probably a species that, over the very long term, it was gradually becoming extinct in any case. So this species, if you want to visit it in the wild, it actually comes with its own uh, personal bodyguard. You can see him there on the, on the left, who you have to get past to go and have a close look at it. But yeah, it, it bring, a species like this brings up interesting questions as to should you be conserving species that over the long term would be coming extinct through natural causes? Obviously, it's an interesting species. It might make a nice garden plant. Uh, but do you reintroduce things like this back into the wild? Ornamental eucalypts. Like I said earlier, there's so many smaller growing eucalypts that are suitable for gardens and parks that should be grown more, but people just don't know about them or the nurseries aren't growing them. This species here, for example, the flowers open up creamy in colour, they are aged to pink, so you get all the different colours on the one plant. A very open canopy, so you can grow other plants underneath. This is a rare species from WA. Some of the native plant enthusiasts are starting to grow this, but getting people to the Arboretum, showing them this type of species, you know, really gets other people interested. They go out and try to source seedlings. More people start to grow it, and then it ends up in gardens over time. One of the, the, the things the Arboretum is really useful for is evaluating species. 
there's lots of eucalypt species. Some of them are difficult to identify. There's also um, new eucalypt species being up being named from time to time. This is a good example here where there's two species, Eucalyptus wimmerensis and Eucalyptus kajaputia. They look very similar, but one comes from South Australia in the Flinders Ranges and one comes from the Wimmera area. Are the differences that appear to be there caused by genetic differences in the plant, which would make them good species, or are they caused by environmental differences in where they grow? So I can take seed from these two things, bring them to the arboretum, grow them together under uniform conditions, and see if they look different there. If I still can't tell them apart, and, and nobody else can, um, then it seems fair to call them the same species. And of course, that has uh, all sorts of conservation implications as well. Uh, here's another example here. This species, Eucalyptus conglobata, in, uh, on the mainland, it, it looks like that smallish, bushy growing one on the right. On the island off the coast of South Australia, it's quite a tall tree. But I've taken seed from both of these, grown them at Currency Creek Arboretum for 15 years now and they both grow into small bushy trees. So it's just the environmental difference on those two sites that causes those plants to look different like that. In another case like this one here, these two species have very similar features in the leaves, the buds and fruits, but one of them produces a lignotuba or a mallee root and reshoots back from the base following fire, that's the one on the right, and the other one doesn't produce a mallee root, and it's killed by fire. That's the one on the left. If you take seed from them, bring them into cultivation, they maintain that difference in how they regenerate. So they have different regeneration strategies. So it makes sense to call them different species or subspecies um, from a botanical point of view, but also from a practical point of view, because how you manage populations of each one of these two species um, is quite different. There's about 80 different species of eucalypts that are actually killed by fire. They don't have the, the mallee root and they don't produce epicormic buds from the branches or the stems following fire. They often grow on these pure, even-age stands. So every black stem there is a tree of that species. It's actually this one here. This one with the great big greenish yellow flowers. And all of them would be the same age. A fire went through there about a year before I took that shot and every green plant underneath it is also that species. They all came up after the fire. So they tend to grow on these even-age stands. Most of these obligate cedar species come from Western Australia, but there's also a handful of them from the eastern states that include the great big uh, forest trees like mountain ash and uh, alpine ash. The identification and study of hybrids, Currency Creek Arboretum can bring them into cultivation and do all sorts of studies to, to work out what are hybrids and what aren't. There's a student from the University of Tasmania who's looking at pollen pollution and looking at what eucalypts will hybridise with other eucalypts and what sort of implications that has on plantation eucalypts and planting plantation eucalypts next to natural stands in terms of pollen flow onto the natural stands and whether hybrids will come up rather than the original species. Regeneration strategies, I touched on that. Um, a few years ago now, quite a few years ago, we did a fire trial there where I burnt about 200 different species, had all the local uh, fire brigades involved with the training exercise there that basically they lit up a block of trees and, and burnt it all, and I could measure which ones grew back and which ones didn't, how soon they flowered again, all sorts of information like that. One of the advantages of, I guess, owning your own arboretum in a way is you can do this destructive type research, and you sort of don't have to ask too many people permission um, other, other than yourself, you know, are you willing to sacrifice a few species perhaps or a few trees to, um, to get some sort of interesting research out of it? And I don't mind doing that if it gives me some, some interesting, uh, interesting results. Another study that I was involved with at Currency Creek Arboretum, and I should say that a lot of these studies are initiated or are undertaken by other people at Currency Creek Arboretum. I'm just helping out by well, supplying the trees, at, first of all, of course, but also in, in helping them uh, identify the plants on the site and how they interact with one another and, and uh, sort of all that sort of thing. This study, we were looking at carbon isotopes in re-sprouts, and what we did, we cut down a heap of trees. There was also various obligate cedar species like this one. They're the ones that don't have the mallee root. So we couldn't cut them down because they wouldn't have reshot. so we had to pretty well pull every leaf off the tree, defoliate it. And each time the tree shoots back, we cut off those shoots, sent them to Germany, and they analysed them to see if the carbon that the reshoots were using to grow was assimilated last year, the year before, or however many years before that. That's an ongoing study, and again, it involves the sacrifice of trees sometimes, but you get, you get all sorts of interesting information out of that. 
And promotion and education, like I said earlier, I do enjoy taking groups of people through the Arboretum. I wish I had more time to do that, but the Arboretum doesn't actually pay my way. I, um, I own a consultancy business in Adelaide where I have to do real work, I guess you could say, rather than just showing people around the Arboretum. But I do get out a lot out of that as well, and, and so do the people, obviously. So we have the occasional open days or groups of people like Australian plant societies, land care groups, all sorts of people. Uh, groups, I should say, come in and you know, I can show them various things through there. Nothing is actually labelled on site, but because everything's in rows and every tree position is recorded, then everything's kept track of in that manner for all ages. So there you go, some nice um, Carimbia gum nuts and some eucalyptus bud caps on the fingers there. Where am I at with Currency Creek Arboretum? Over the last 20 years, I've planted about 9,400 trees on the site, representing about 900 eucalypt taxa. So probably I've at least tried to grow between 90 and 95% of all the eucalypt taxa species and subspecies that are known. Some of the tropical species won't grow too well there because it's, it's relatively cold in winter. Some of the high rainfall ones there struggle in summer as well. Um, but I'm still putting in more trees each year, although the blocks of trees are getting smaller because uh, other projects are <laughs> taking me away from so much field work, but also because there's literally less space on the property itself. So that concludes my talk. It was a very brief and quick introduction about Currency Creek Arboretum and, and what I'm doing. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.